Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, live from Asbury Church, Tulsa, Oklahoma. My name is Peter Taiwan Rod, and I will be your online host for today. We are glad you are here. I'd like to let you know that you are in the right place. Help us to know that you are in the right place by checking in. Uh, and check in is for everyone. If you are a first time guest, please check in with us. Uh, we would love to get to know you. And this is the online experience for 9.30 a.m. traditional service. Do you want to get to connect with others? We also have a chat room for you. You can greet one another and tell them where you're from. You can even pray with one another through the chat room as well. But if you need a prayer request, we also have a little pray um, private room that you can submit your prayer request by click the button right below the live um, player. Also, uh, we will do communion together. This is the way that we will join together and remember what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross through this Holy Communion. We will do this together right after Pastor Tom message. Please be prepared to communion elements such as bread, juice, um, crackers. Um, again, I'd like to let you know that uh, you are welcome here. And uh, thank you for being with us this morning. Be prepared your heart and your mind and let us worship the Most High God together.
amen. Well, welcome in the mighty name of Jesus. Friends, know that you are so loved, you are prayed for, and you belong here. This morning, we're beginning a new sermon series titled Axioms. And the axiom we're talking about today is friends and the importance of friends, the importance of community and the people around you. And so what a joy it is this morning to be gathered as friends, to be gathered as a community with a shared purpose of worshiping our great God. We'll worship this morning by hearing God's word be proclaimed in the scriptures and the songs. We'll then respond by coming to the Lord's table for communion. And then finally, at the very end of this service, we'll be sent forth in Jesus' name out into the world on mission. At this time though, I would like to encourage each of us to check in. Uh, Here's how you'll check in this morning. If you're here in the sanctuary, you'll simply grab your cell phone. You'll go to the camera app on your cell phone and you'll scan the QR code on the pew in front of you. And to all of our friends who are online worshiping with us right now, you'll simply follow the link that was shared by one of our amazing pastors in the comment section and uh, you'll be able to check in that way. Also, if this is your first time here at Asbury, we want to say welcome. Uh, We're so glad that you're here. Uh, You know, as we just shared, uh, this sermon today is about friendship. And I believe that here at Asbury, you'll find such wonderful, wonderful friends. I know I have. Uh, But we would love also, if this is your first time here, for you to participate with us in our mission, which is helping others follow Jesus. And so if you check in this morning as a first, second, or third time guest, uh, we'll donate $10 toward an organization helping Ukraine uh, on your behalf. Just a small practical way for us to live into our mission of, uh, of helping others follow Jesus. As we continue on in worship this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do love you so very much. And we proclaim that you are creator of the universe. You are perfect in all of your ways. And still, God, you call us friend. You invite us to walk with you and to talk with you. You invite us to fellowship with you. So thank you for that. God, we worship you this morning. And all this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. As Pastor John just said, we gather together this morning to worship the Lord our God, for who he is and all he has done. So as you are able, I want to invite you to join us standing as we begin with this great hymn, Worthy of Worship. Let's sing this together. Worthy of Worship. Worthy of
really have the opportunity to gather together as the body of Christ to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And every time we have that opportunity, it's such a joy to join our voices to profess that which is central to our faith. So this morning, I invite us to unite our voices through this historic creed, the Apostles' Creed, as we profess that which is central to our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, special day because this is graduation Sunday. So this morning, as we prepare to honor the graduating class of 2020, we're going to turn our attention to a video. And as they're doing that, Adam Hare and Caroline Avey are going to uh, lead us in a great song called Gratitude.
that long ago that uh, some of your parents were standing here and uh, we were asking them if they would, as you were baptized or as you were confirmed or at some point in your life, uh, we've had the privilege to be involved in your lives and you're at a turning point right now, a graduation. We want to say congratulations. And uh, so your, your life is, uh, has been good and it's going to get even better. And so I wanted, uh, just on behalf of this congregation, uh, to say to you, we're invested in you, and we want you to do well. And we want you to be able to come back and to be part of this church, because you graduate doesn't mean that you graduate from church, okay? Uh, so we want you to be part of the church for as long as you live. And so it's been my privilege to be with you uh, for many years, and I speak on behalf of families, uh, how much we love you, how we're committed for you, and how we're going to pray for you. And so we want you to know that we're here. We're not going anywhere. We're here for you. Uh, and we will uphold you with our, with our prayers for these days to come. But we wanted to say congratulations to you and the Lord bless you. And as new paths are open uh, in your lives in the days to come, uh, remember to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things shall be added unto you. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks for this moment and for these lives, for the families that are represented here, for all of the good things, for the challenges that have been in the past, and for the opportunities in the future. And we pray, Lord, that you'll bless these graduates as they go and find their places in, the, in, in those roles that you've called them. So hear our prayer this day. We give you thanks. We love you. We love these students. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, shall we receive them once more at class of 2022? Here we go. Y'all are welcome to stay down here if you like. But <laughs> they look good. Don't they look good? Yeah. They love the hats. Oh, my. Yeah. There you go.
right, thank you, thank you. We began a new sermon series today on axioms, and that's uh, those are worthy sayings. And uh, I started uh, collecting these years ago, and uh, it's been uh, kind of a just a, a little hobby that I have, and always adding new uh, new ones to the list. And so uh, this one is today is show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. And so there's all kinds of ones that go off of this. This is a Denzel Washington. You hang around the barber shop, shop long enough, sooner or later, later, you'll get a haircut. And so there are all kinds of things. C.S. Lewis talked about how that friendship begins the moment when one person turns to the other and says, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. So there are a lot of axioms about friendships, but we wanted to do this today because our seniors are gonna be making friendships and the friendships that they're gonna be making over the next period of their life can be life long lasting. We had the service of the other day for a member of our congregation, Jim Barrett. And uh, Jim uh, was at the University of Oklahoma, made friends there. And, and that's really kind of charts the course of your life. And so uh, yesterday, uh, 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 Dana and I went to uh, the Lurkey's house, Tom and Phyllis's house, and we saw Jordan Linderman. And you all remember the Linderman family, Jim, his father, and Beth. And uh, Jim, of course, went to be with the Lord, but Beth was, was present. And so there was Jordan. He's grown up. He's getting married. And so got to meet his fiance. And so it was really good. Guess where they met? They met at the Wesley Foundation, the University of Arkansas. Show me your friends, who you hang with, I'll show you your future. And this is really, really what I wanna to talk to you all about today to reinforce this message. So, as we look at this concept, show me your friends, I'll show you your future, we begin, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings chapter 12, Old Testament. And if you don't have your Bibles, there are pew Bibles, it's found on page 344. We'll be there in just a moment, but let me give you a little background. So it begins with Solomon, who when in chapter two, his father David dies, and he becomes the new king, chapter three. And so the Lord says, you can ask for whatever you want, and I'll grant it to you. And so Solomon, instead of asking for wealth or long life, he asked for wisdom. And so that is granted. And it's interesting because wise people often become wealthy. It's not always true, but there's a, there's a much better chance. Wisdom, rather than foolishness, will lead to wealth and a very productive life. And so we see this with Solomon. He becomes wise, he becomes wealthy, and he becomes worldwide famous. And so people like the Queen of Sheba comes by and to see him. But, but also in, we see that he is the one that builds the great temple in Jerusalem. And this is the place of worship. So we could add that W to Solomon's life, that he was a worshiper of God. And when that, that magnificent complex was finished, then it says that the glory of the Lord filled the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, the Tent of Meeting came into that place and, and God's glory blessed those. So we see this with Solomon. Everything is going wonderfully well in Solomon's life until you come to chapter 11. And we did a sermon series a while back called the But Series because I noticed that in the Bible how often it has that little word that is a hinge and things are going one way, and then you have the word but, and it transitions, and it goes a different way. And so we see that word now. In chapter 11, that's how that chapter begins with that word now. In other words, flashing lights now. Something bad is about to happen. Everything good has been taking place. And so it says in chapter 2, Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and I can't say this without thinking of the child in the Sunday school class that called him the 300 porcupines. <laughs> when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David, his father. Again, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. 
And that was true with the wisest man in the world, Solomon. And so he's going to die, and he's going to be succeeded by his son, which was a mistake. There's somebody else that Jeroboam should have been the guy that was going to rule, but Rehoboam is going to su succeed his father. And so this is going to be a transition period. And with this transition, he's going to be faced with some choices. Now, the problem with Rehoboam, he has no experience. He's a young man, and he, he doesn't have any experience. He's never done this before. I mean, how do you, you know, being a king for dummies? I mean, what book do you consult? So what is it that he's going to do? But he's going to be making a transition, but he has precious little experience. Secondly, we have the problem with his dad, apostasy, Apostasy means that you have turned from the faith. And that's what his father had done, that he started serving the other gods of his friends, of his wives, and these influences. And so his heart went away from serving God. And so Rehoboam has got to make a decision on who he's going to worship. Is he going to go in the way of David, his grandfather, or is he going to end up like Solomon did for the first part of his life, but when he was old, he turned and he went astray. He's got a decision he's got to make about who he's going to worship. And then third, we see that he's got a problem because the people are tired of what's going on. The people are very upset, and they're going to come to Rehoboam, and they're going to say, listen, you know, your father was very wealthy, but you know how he got his wealth. Some of his wealth came at our expense, and he taxed us, and he burned us. And, you know, the Israelites came out of Egypt. They were crushed by Pharaoh, who made them work so very hard. And they were saying, basically, that your father has been treating us like we were treated when we were in Egypt. Your father is like Pharaoh, and he's crushing us with these heavy taxes. And so they come to him, and they're making a plea, stop this. You've got to stop this. And so this is going to be the decision that he's going to make. Who is he going to listen to? This young man, he's stepping into a new role. He doesn't really know what he's doing, and he's going to be listening to voices. So in response to the reverence we have in our heart for God's word, let's stand. We're going to read 1 Kings chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, and John is going to lead you 6 through 11. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. That's the transition. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon. And uh, I was just thinking, uh, Leanne came up to me just a moment ago, and she said, you know, today's my birthday. I knew that. I uh, left a message with her yesterday, but uh, she also said it's Yoav's birthday. So those of you that have been with me in Israel know Yoav. This is his birthday today. So I sent him, just went in and sent him a, a text. But he would say about this that their names probably were not actually Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Those are probably throne names, okay? So they're probably, you know, we might call them Ray and Jerry. I don't know, but anyway... And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon, then Jeroboam returned from Egypt, and they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to him, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. And he said to them, Go away for three days, then come again to me. So the people went away.
Wow. <laughs> There's my microphone. Isn't that an amazing text? Wow. Uh, thank you. You may be seated, and let's pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, the good news is he asked for advice. The bad news is he listened to the wrong people. He had the wrong friends. He went to the guys that are young and inexperienced and they don't know what they're doing. But this is kind of the way life is. And this is not about age. This is about experience. This is about listening. This is about humility. So we don't do the chronology thing, but they're, they're wise people who are young and they're foolish people who are old. So it's not always that, but you want to listen to wise people. And so this is the decision that he's going to make, and he makes the wrong decision because the young men had job security if their buddy is in charge, if he's the king. And so they wanted to promote him so they would have a, a, a place and not lose their position. And so it was a great time, a great opportunity to listen, to make change. Now, I do these axioms, and because there's a reason that they're in my list, because I've got a, they've had an influence, an impact in my life. I've, I've got nearly a story with every one of them. And so there's one that I have with this one. I've shared this with you before, but, but on Grad Sunday, and I'll share this with the grads at, at 11 o'clock, but my first year at Oral Roberts University, uh, I had a class that I did not like. It was called Humanities. My wife loved Humanities. I hated Humanities. I mean, there's just a bunch of old dead people, you know? I just like, ah, I'm not interested in that. But I had a friend, his name was Jim. Jim was, he was so much fun to be with. And he was a cartoonist. And so I would go to class, the auditorium held about 100 people. I'd go to the class and, and, and Jim would motion for me because he saved me a seat and I'd sit next to him. And we would goof off and he would draw cartoons. He'd draw cartoons of the professor, the other students, and we'd talk about the football game. We paid no attention to the lecture, no, no attention to the assignments. Came midterm, guess who was flunking? And I realized at that point, this axiom, show me your friends, Jim, or professor, and I will show you your future. So I could continue to go to the humanities class that I did not like and sit with Jim and flunk out. Or I could say no, because he was always motioning for me and he would point, he saved me a seat. I had a decision to make. And so as I began to think about that, if I had sat next to him, I might have gotten into that habit and that might have carried over to other classes. I may never have graduated from college. Jim did not graduate from college, at least not from ORU. And this isn't to say that you've got to go to college and have a degree to be successful, because I don't believe that at all. But I had a choice to make that was gonna determine my future. And usually choices, we think they're real big, but a lot of times the choices we make, the life that we live, becomes a process of the habits that we form. And so if we form bad habits by hanging around the wrong people, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And so this is what happened with me and with Jim. And I learned that early on. And so I don't think I would be your pastor had I not finished so this is the best book. I put this in, in your sermon journal. This is the best book I've read this year. It's not a Christian book, but it has so many great things. And even as John referenced it at the eight o'clock service, as we invited people to communion, you're invited. It's subtitled, The Art and Science of Cultivating Influence. You're invited. John Levy writes this, the fundamental element that defines the quality of our lives is the people we surround ourselves with and the conversations we have with them. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And you hang around with certain types of people and you'll be able to maybe run the Boston Marathon. You hang around with certain people and you're gonna end up in some rehab treatment. I mean, it depends, the friends were around. The, the, and these students that stood right before us in just a moment, you think about the friends that they're going to make those first couple of months if they go to college and the difference those friends are gonna make in their lives may determine 
whether they succeed or whether they drop out. And so I was hanging around Jordan's friends last night and saw so many Asbury kids that are now grown, some of them married themselves. It was really wonderful because I saw that in Jordan's life, that he's made good friends and it's coming back to bless him. So as we think about this, this is her name, Jean Nidech. Let me tell you Jean's story. It's in this book, You're Invited. So Jean was someone who struggled with weight all of her life. When she was 38 years old, she, she was 5'7", weighed 214 pounds. She would wear a size 44 muumuu, and that embarrassed her, so she clipped the label out and wrote in it size 20. And so that made her feel better, but the reality was she wore a size 44. When she went to the store, she would buy boxes of cookies. And when the clerk would check her out, she was embarrassed by what she was doing, but she would say, she would lie, she would say, these are for my children. Uh, and then she would take the cookies home and hide them in the bathroom, and she would binge eat cookies at different settings. One time she was in the supermarket and somebody came up and said, Jean, you're looking really, really great. And Jean was kind of surprised and said, well, thank you. And then the lady said, and when are you due? She thought she was pregnant. Jean took that as motivation to change her life, and so she went on diets, and she did just everything that she could. Nothing worked. And what, in fact, she found she was actually gaining weight when she'd go on a diet because she would, she would lose. She'd, like, starve herself, and then she'd get ravenously hungry and then would binge eat, and she gained more weight. She was just distraught. She didn't want to live like that but didn't know what else to do. The other systems weren't working, so she devised a system Kind of like what John Wesley did, not with issues of weight, but issues of spirituality. And that's why he called his people Methodists, because they were methodical. She became methodical. She invited six friends to her house, and they were all women who were struggling with issues of weight. And she said, we've got we to gotta create a new system. And here's the system. The system is going to be, the, we got one rule. Before we start, we go see a doctor and make sure that everything is okay. So she started, and in a year's time, Jean lost 70 pounds, and she kept that weight off for the next 53 years of her life. So what happened was that the system worked, and other women started coming to Jean and saying, what is it that you're doing? And she said, well, it's basically a support system and we get together and, she, and there was a way that they processed this and they encouraged each other and it was really a very good kind of a thing that developed and, and it just kept going and growing. And so, you know, what I told you about being wise often leads to wealth. Jean became a multi-millionaire and she influenced. And that's why you see this note, the art and science of cultivating influence. She influenced tens of millions of people around the world. And when she died at the age of 91, her organization called Weight Watchers International had stood the test of time. You see what happened? She formed a support group. And you know what we are as a church? We're a great big support group because we all struggle with something, don't we? We all have problems. And that's the great mystery is that we can come together and support one another. Nobody's perfect. We all have issues. We all have struggles. We all have doubts and disappointments. And we all deal with depression and death. And we have these highs and lows. That's life. But we have a place to come together. And we say, you know, I don't come here to condemn you, you know, but let's help each other. Let's be with one another. This is something that we see is part of the church and is a really, really wonderful thing that can happen. And, and it's really great because just a moment ago, I saw Gwen come down here. This is Gwen. She was one wearing cap and gown just a moment ago. Uh, about a month ago, this is their daughter. Uh, and her name is Rue. Rue's four years old. She got baptized uh, a few weeks ago. Last Sunday, this is Tasha. And Tasha is 12 years old. She was confirmed last Sunday. This is Adam, and Adam and Kate, these are his, their three daughters. And so I thought, isn't this wonderful? A four-year-old, a 12-year-old, an 18-year-old. You know who's impacting them all? The church. But you see, Adam and Kate have made a decision 
that they're going to bring their kids to church. There's no argument. That's why I'm here, because my parents, against my protesting, as I remember Coach Blankenship used to say, when I was a kid, I had a drug problem. My parents drugged me to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. My parents did that for me. They helped me. They said, this is what we do. This is our identity. We're people who follow God, and we're going to church. Just think if parents quit parenting and said, no, do whatever you want on Sunday morning. I don't want to go to church either. I'd just sleep in. We had so many. Try that at school. Why do the parents say, no, you can sleep in on Sunday morning, but they don't tell the kids that on Monday when you got to go to school? I don't understand that. And at the end of the life, which is going to be really more important? Well, it's in the apples and oranges, but why do we do this? Why has it become part of the culture in America to say that going to church once a month is, is normal? Why are we not here every Sunday? Let me tell you, if Weight Watchers, you go once a month, is it going to change your life? You can be here every week, friends, only for a reason you know God would approve. You need to be here. You need to be here. Now, some can't come. We understand that. We have opportunities. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're really serious about this, you're going to be here every Sunday because something special happens in this room. So this is what was going on. We see this evidence in so many ways. This is not a, an American problem. This is not a problem in the 21st century. This is a problem that goes way back. And if you look in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, it says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. So even back in the first century, Christians were like, eh, we're going to sleep in today. When we neglect our spiritual lives and we let other priorities become more important, it's called erosion. Erosion doesn't happen suddenly. Erosion slowly, quietly. It's like the ship just slips away from its moorings and then is lost at sea. What happened to Solomon? What happened to Rehoboam? What happened to my friend Jim? I mean, we have a choice to make. Which way are we going to go? And so a lot of times we talk about the seven deadly sins and pride, envy, anger, lust, greed, gluttony, and sloth. Sloth comes at the end. Sloth makes us lazy and says, it doesn't really matter. It does matter. And so what we've got to do is that we've got to, we got to change our system. John Ortberg, a pastor, was driving in his car going to a destination. He was not sure he knew where he was, so he turned on his GPS, the global positioning satellite. And so the GPS told him, how to go. Well, John didn't agree with that. So he said, it said, turn left. He turned right because he thought he knew better. So he goes driving and he's going down the road. You know what the GPS does. You know, it says recalculating <laughs> at the next possible moment, do a U-turn. And so he, he knows better than the GPS. So he turns it off. He gets lost as a goose. His wife loves it, you know. He turns it back on, and you know what it said, what the voice said? You fool. <laughs> I told you so. And now you want me to help you get home? No way, Jose. Now, of course, it says, recalculating the route. As soon as it's safely possible, do a U-turn. That's called Grace. And that's what Jesus comes. Listen, you don't have to come in here and say, well, you know, God doesn't love me because I haven't performed good enough. Hey, just hit the reset button. Just hit the reset button. As Martin Luther's axiom was, life is a series of acts of repentance. We just turn around every day. We do it again and again. But we need a system. And we believe that's the word of God, the Bible, the scriptures, and we believe that part of that is taking communion. Part of that is being with the family of God. And the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. I conclude by saying, show me your friends. 
I'll show you your future. It's absolutely true of kids of any age. Show me your friends. They have tremendous impact. Their habits, their language, their customs, their style, their behavior, their attitudes, all will affect us. They do. Secondly, I would say, show me your friend and I will show you your future. And that's what I love in John chapter 15. Jesus says, as he's talking, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And then he switches and he said, you know, guys, I no longer call you servants. I call you my friend. We all need friends, but we all need one friend in particular who offers us his grace. We've all had times in our lives that we needed to recalculate the route we were on. And that's what this moment is about, that we might give our hearts back to our best friend ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Church, this morning, God's word has been proclaimed in such a powerful way. So now this is our time, our opportunity to respond to that proclamation. You know, one of my favorite aspects of communion is that we do it together. This is a corporate invitation, a corporate meal. And notice whenever we go through the liturgy, it's not, God, I confess, I confess, I confess. It's God, we confess. There are these plural words used all throughout the liturgy. So I invite you now to hear these gracious words of invitation, my friends. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Church, hear the greatest news of all time. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. And so, in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to, to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, he gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And here's this great prayer, and hope that you've memorized this, and it becomes part of your life, and as we gather and as we share these words, that it will it'll resonate within your heart. So join with us as we pray. Pour, Pour out, out your Holy Spirit, Spirit on us gathered, gathered here and, and on these gifts of bread, bread and wine. Make, make them, them be for us the body and blood of Christ, Christ that, that we may be for the world 
the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Well, friends, I just want to remind you that you are so loved and that you are invited to this table. You are invited to this meal. You don't have to be a member of this church or of any church to participate. And so in a moment, you'll be released by pews by a communion host, and he or she will direct you to the nearest communion station to you. There at your communion station, you'll receive a small plastic disposable cup. Uh, In that cup will be a piece of delicious bread that's already been dipped in grape juice by our, again, amazing communion stewards. After you receive that cup with the bread and the juice in it, you're invited to return to your pews or come on down to the prayer rails and uh, spend some time in prayer there. Also, if you have your tithes and your offerings with you this morning, you're invited to bring those with you to the communion station, and you can drop them off in the boxes located at each communion station. Uh, But again, know that you are loved and that you are invited. So come as you are. All are welcome. All are invited. Welcome back. Thank you, everyone, for watching to the end. It's great to see all of you watching from many different locations. I have a, a person, Sanita from Virginia, dad from Oklahoma City, Horning from uh, Illinois. Thank you, thank you so much for worshiping, worshiping with us this morning. And now it's time for communions. And I'd like to uh, remind you, all are invited to the table. At this time, I invite you to grab a piece of bread. Brother and sister, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Also, in the same time, I invite you to uh, grab a grape juice. Brother and sister, this is the blood of Christ put out for you. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us on the cross. And right now, Lord, purify us, O Lord. Make us new again. Help us to have mind of Christ. Please draw us close to you each day. Protect us with your mighty power. And heal us, O Lord, from inside out. Holy Spirit, empower us to help others follow Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Welcome, hi, Pastor hi, Tom. Hi, friend. How are you? Good. How are you doing, friend? <laughs> I'm doing well. Yes. I'm doing well. It's Great good to have friends. Yes. Good, good to, to see all friends. the kids um, oh, yeah. graduate from you know, yeah. high school today. Yeah. I have lots of memories. Yes. You know? So some of those... Even like there's one that uh, I did the memorial service for uh-huh. his grandfather. Okay. Uh, when I was in Salisaw. Okay. Uh, I married his parents. Oh wow. Uh, kids that I knew, their grandparents in uh, Rose Hill growing yes. up. Yes. I mean, I have these long associations, not with yes. all of them, but with a lot of them. Uh, their names are coming down. It's like yes. Oh my goodness! Wow. I know. I remember so, saw them since they were sixth grade. Saw them growing up. Yeah. Saw them went. We went. I went to mission trip. Oh, with uh-huh. them yeah. at uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. yeah. And now they graduated. Now they're graduating. That was like yeah. a good time. Yeah. Sometimes so fast. That's right. Fast, yeah. so. It happens quick, and it happens yeah. quick with your kids too. I know. I you know. know. So yeah. So, yes. But it's good, and you know yeah. that's what what you want. Give them a good foundation yes. and hope that they'll build yes. on it. So. Yes. Uh-huh. And and your sermon today was where well make me remind me of, of the word is. In Proverbs, iron sharp, iron sharp. Yes, that's right. I thought that is right. a is a great word. And right. can you can you help us with to implement that iron sharp, iron? Um, yeah, that's yeah. That's so two things. One by itself doesn't help. Mm-hmm. But you need two. Two are better than one. Yes. And so yes. that's that was the image. So you you want you need you need help. You know? Yes. So you want both hands. Yes. Both and hands. So there's uh, uh, all kinds of young and old, male and female. You know. Yes. So uh, so. Uh, there, there's all kinds of, of ways that, that that we do that, but 
you know, yes. we want to we want to work it out. We want these our young people to be with yes. sharp people yes. and to be, you know, in places of, of influence as well. So. You were emphasized about wisdom, to get right. the wisdom. Right. Because that's that right. is when you that's go right. out to the world, that's, that's right. what we need to, to get that's the right. wisdom, the Lord, uh, to make a decision in life, yeah. you know, and yeah. um, and also you mentioned about spiritual life. Yeah. The word erosion, right. which is like you don't it, want. It just goes quickly, you know, yeah. just a little bit at a time. Yes. Over time, just 1%. Just, yes. you know, in, at the end of the year, yes. you'll be down 37%. Yes. Just 1%. It's just, yes. or the same thing is true if you go in the good way. So you don't have, right. you just got to make a decision. But I thought that was so interesting about the Weight Watchers. And that uh -huh. then if she just went once a month, it wouldn't change her life. Change. She had to make a commitment. And yes. so she showed up and that was the deal. And that's yes. John Wesley. Yes. You know, the same thing. You got to make it, got to make a commitment. Yes. You got to show up and just like, well, I hope it happens. It mm -hmm. won't happen. It will yeah. not happen. You got to make a commitment. You got to show up. Yeah. Yes. So show up. That's why I'm obnoxious. <laughs> yes. Yes. As Pastor mm -hmm. Sam say, like, you have to show up on Sunday in right. church you, unless, right. unless, unless, unless there's, there's a reason, reason you know, God would approve. Yes. That's what I say. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And there are those times. Yes. And so some people, like, I saw uh, today a guy just had back surgery, and this is like his first uh -huh. sermon, first time back, you know, first service back. And so, it's like, yeah, okay, well, those are reasons you, yes. you know, so uh, so we understand and uh, we're delighted uh, uh, to be able to, to help folks, but that's that's why we're yes. here. Uh, so not to condemn, but we do make judgments. Yes. There's a difference in condemnation and uh -huh. judgment. We got to make judgments about mm -hmm. how we're going to live, but we don't condemn people. And yes. we're always rooting for people to make a U-turn, you know, because yes. we have to do that too. Yes. Everybody's always yes. making U-turns, repositioning. Yes. 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 So thank you so much for so, uh, reminding us uh, this morning. Um, just your blessing to our lives. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Back Good. to you. Back to worship.
join me in our prayer after receiving. You'll find the words on the screen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to help others follow Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Praise God from who? Well, you know, in the sermon today, we talked a lot about friendship and show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Well, look at all these people out here. They're now your friends. Even more, they're now your family. So uh, we're so excited you all are joining the Asbury family this morning. So I have one very important question I'd like to ask you. Will you be loyal to Jesus Christ as expressed through Asbury? And will you uphold this wonderful congregation by five things, by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, we will. Amen. Welcome, congregation. This is Abigail Mallory and Lonnie Vandewig. Did I say that correctly? Let's celebrate these two amazing, amazing people. And the congregation, we have a response to make. Let's say these words together. We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's holy church, and we bid you welcome to Asbury. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Amen. Church, let's celebrate once more this morning. So this Thursday is National Day of Prayer, a day that's all about praying for our nation and praying for our leaders. And so we're having a National Day of Prayer service at 7 a.m. It's kind of early, 7 a.m. that Thursday morning, this Thursday in the chapel. We're gonna have a time of praise and worship, a time of prayer, and the Lieutenant Governor will even be there and will share a brief message with us. You won't wanna miss it. And then at the end, there's breakfast burritos because it's also Cinco de Mayo. So it's gonna be a very fun, very fun prayer service. So now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.